Mm-hmm. Welcome, welcome to the Ethan and Elvin Show. I'm your host, Ethan Zollner. It's episode 55. I'm the executive producer, by the way, Jake. Don't you forget that. Anyways, I got my co-host, Elvin Mims. I got Jake Beckett, the NBL Insider. What's going on, fellas? Not too much. How are you? How you doing, E? I'm good, man. I'm good. All right, that's good. Making sure. Got to check in on you. Anyways, in case anyone's wondering, we're based out of London, Ontario, Canada, and we're going to get right into some NBA news. The Toronto Raptors played the Heat Tuesday night, fellas. Mm-hmm. I know it's a little late, but Serge Ibaka and James Johnson, <laughs> they uh, they got into a little scuffle, didn't they? Oh, uh, yeah. What did you guys think of that? I like it. <laughs> well, you like to see a little, a little, you know, a little grit behind it, man. But it's, uh, I think, uh, like we were saying, man, I don't think Ibaka wanted those problems, though. A, you can see it. He can see. Lot, he yeah. has like the tough guy look, and then all of a sudden he kind of snaps yeah, into like. Yeah, I think he, he yeah. knows jujitsu. Yeah, I think mind. he knows. Uh, this guy might actually know how to fight. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's a big six nine right there. Yeah. And he's got a seven foot reach. I don't want to mess with that guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jake. They're throwing punches. They were getting a little heated. The Miami Heat and the Raptors got a bit of a rivalry going. DeMar DeRozan and uh, Gordon Drogas had a little exchange of just looks, literally looks, and DeMar DeRozan just shoved him. What do you, what do you think about that? Do you think that's bad blood from the playoffs? Uh, I don't think that blows off from the playoffs. That's like a B-list player in Drogas going at uh, an A-list player in DeRozan. So true. I don't know if it's necessarily a playoff um, boiling over from last year. Uh, it might just be heat of the moment. Stuff already went down between teammates. Um, we don't know what was said throughout the game, true. Yeah. Um, they got fine, though. We got Serge Ibaka got one game. So did James Johnson. I think that's fair. You know, you guys want to be idiots and you want to wrestle around. Go ahead. But you're going to get the fine for it or the suspension. DeMar Rosen got 25000 and. Goran Dragic only got 10. Now, I'm trying to figure out why they both didn't get fined equally. Is it because DeMar in- instigated the whole thing? I don't know. No, but what did you say that he, he shoved Dragic? Yeah, but Dragic was also looking at him at the end of the game. I mean, they were, they were uh, saying things, John. But still, though, he shoved him. He made some kind of physical contact yeah, he with him versus shame. looking. That's, that's a big difference, man. You can't, but for God, yeah. you can't stop somebody from looking at somebody. But, I mean, you can find him for, you got to see what the fines are for and get instigating something versus just reacting to yeah. it, right? So, Very true. Um, I guess. And you're all right, though, about Gordon Drogic going at DeMar. You're like, what are you doing, man? You're B-list. Get yeah. out of here. Get I mean, out of here. It might be a lot of things, right? They might be, you know, the, the Heat actually might be trying to, you know, just play head games, like a little psychological well, warfare for later on down the road, right? Just try to get the Raptors focused more on the physical thing than actual playing basketball. So, Well, here's the thing. Pascal Siakam, he was supposed to close out on Wayne Ellington. Uh-huh. Didn't really do that great of a job. Second year mistake, kind of a rookie mistake ish. It's okay. I'm, I'm sure he definitely had it broken down in the film how he was supposed to guard him and break him down. But at the same time, hey, Miami Heat won. They won 90 89. Wayne Ellington got the go ahead bucket. There's nothing you can do about it. It was just a mental lapse. It's unfortunate, but I feel like the Raptors should have won that game. Yeah. What it's, do you think, Jake? Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know what Siakam was doing out there, actually. Yeah. What kind of matchup is that? Siakam, you may not have the tri- size of a true big, but he's technically a big. He's slow he's like a, four. a big. Um, and Wayne Ellington, he's known as a shooter, but yeah. obviously he can put it on the floor, get to the basket. So I think it might have just been a de- defensive lack, uh, lacks on their end. But Now, Mr. Mims, you're in GM mode, I heard, earlier before yeah, this. Yeah, I was. I was you got your I, cap I, on. I, I turned it down to trade earlier, man. That was... He turned out a trade because we're covering. We divided up the NBA teams and MBLC teams and all that jazz. We, we uh, there's more to come in that. But Elvin, he's got the. I got him focused in GM mode, and there's going to be a couple things coming up. But anyways, Elvin, what's up? You're a GM slash coach. Okay. What are you saying the next day in film when you're going over everything with Siakam? What to do properly? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not at that situation, dude. You're not gonna. I'm not gonna calm down on him. No, uh, not not too harsh. It, it happens. Like perf- like veterans make mistakes like that. I think for the most part, for what Siakam's been bringing to the team, a lapse like that 
it, you know what I'm saying? You can kind of live with that. You take you know the good with the bad. Yeah, take the good. It's like one of those take the good with the bad. You don't want to discourage them from all the positive stuff and the energy that he's bringing, focusing solely on, you know, one little mental mistake. You get what I'm saying? So you just come in, you break it down. I don't think in film session you even really single him out. But mentally, he knows what he did. You know, it's no sense in harping on it. You just you pull him to the side out of practice or something and, or bring that situation back up later. Let him kind of review it. Maybe even let him tell you what he think he should have done to see if his head was right and he was just kind of caught in the moment or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And just move on from that, man. Like That's the beauty of basketball, right? He can come out the next game and do a play that wins him a basketball game. You get what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, if you got somebody out there that's just constantly bonehead move, bonehead move, bonehead <coughs> move, then it's an issue. But for what he's been bringing to the Raptors versus what just happened, man, I mean, you, uh, you can live with that. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, then, fellas. Since we still got the GM theme going for now, the Utah Jazz, for some reason, are trying to unload Derek Favors, and that's been a trend for the last two years. Yeah. I don't know why, but for some reason, they just want to offload Derek Favors. I think he's a perfect fit for them. I think he's working for him just well. They're not in the playoff hunt right now, but they're right there. And they're trying to get Nikola Mirotic. Now, I'm wondering from both you guys, what's the value of Nikola Mirotic? Is a Jazz offer of favors for Mirotic straight up? Because if I'm the Bulls, I say no. I want a little bit more maybe. And if I'm the Jazz, I think maybe that would fit them better. I Like, Derek Favors would work well. But at the same time, Nikola Mirotic is coming out hot. He's fitting in very well. He's averaging almost 20 points a game. I don't know. Pretty valuable compared to Derek Favors, like 12 points a game. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. What do you guys feel? Go ahead, Jake. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I think uh, I wouldn't do the trade. No? We, I, I mentioned on an earlier episode that I don't think Mirotic... Is a guy you bring in to help you win? Per se, you think he's not going to last. I think he's a backup. He's a backup for uh, power four, stretch four, and I don't see the Jazz needing that at the expense of favors. Mm-hmm. Like you said, um, I think every like the Nets back to his time with the Nets, they were trying to trade favors, yeah, all the time. So he's just one of those players that are always their names always going to be out there for trade rumors and the like. So. I think it's a, a valuable of, piece, though. I think yeah. for the for the Bulls, yes, very. Yeah, but I don't think I don't think you give up favors at the for <clears> Miritich <throat> with your hopes of kind of hanging around and getting that eight spot. Then. Yeah, the, true, the, the, true. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I, I I agree with Jake on that one. Um, that that to me, I don't even think about that trade. If I'm the Jazz, man. I mean, you got to think, when Rudy Gobert went out, man, they went to Derrick Favors, and he came right in and was getting buckets. He's filling in excellently right about, in the center right, position. It gives you that scoring presence down low that allows it to open it up for Donovan Mitchell, to open it up for Ingles, to open it up for those very guys. very good point, Elvin. You know what I'm saying? So why would you bring out another guy who wants to just hang out on the perimeter with those guys at and, and, and cloud up their room to work? You have After that, you have no presence inside. Who is that other big that they can go to and try to get a bucket? Because Rudy Gobert, you can't really go to him and say, get me a bucket. Like, he's one of those, you know, Pick, you know, roll, throw him a lob if it's there, catch him on the roll, dunk it. But Derek Favors, you literally can give him the ball on the block with somebody on him, and he gets you a bucket or a good look at the basket or kick out for somebody, a wide open look. Why would you want to give that up just for somebody who can only pick and pop? You know, like, it's just, it's, and plus you're talking about moving Miritich. Does he do the same thing in the Western Conference? You know, True. like, does he do that night in and night out? Like, that's what a competition that does he come in and he do that with, you know, against Portland, against Golden State, against L.A. where he'll have like a Kuzman or have to guard on both ends against teams like that. You know, Draymond Green, Kevin Durant, you know, it's like you're talking about trying to get rid of a valuable post piece to go pick up somebody that has to be on the perimeter and deal with those guys every night. And you know? him and Gobert complement each other excellently when they're on the floor, yes. per, in my opinion, personally. Maybe. And you made an excellent point, too. Once Rudy Gobert comes back, because the Utah Jazz are in the 10th seed right now, they've kind of kept themselves in that fighting position for the 8th, maybe 7th seed. They're there. Having Rudy Gobert back is going to help a lot. In the meantime, they're treading the line very well. You know, they haven't went on a 10-game losing streak or lost, you know, seven, uh, 17 to 20 games like the Lakers, for instance. They're actually putting together some decent basketball, not the best, but they also don't have their best defender on the court mm-hmm. and best rebounder. But it's, it's, you think about it, when Gobert comes back and if you get rid of favors, when it's time to go to that bench for a big, where are you going to go? That's like, true. That's the, that's you got to look past the initial, 
what's night? Like, <laughs> where are you going to go when it's time? Okay, we can't play Rudy Gobert 48 minutes every night. You know what I'm saying? So we're, when we got to go to the bench, where are we going to go or for a good service? if they had to go into a small ball lineup yeah. with Joe Ingles at the fourth. Because you, if you look at coming off the bench, man, you got like Joe. You have nothing but shooters coming off the bench, perimeter players. So why would you want to go get another guy who is just, you know what I'm saying, just basically perimeter oriented? I don't get it, but. And like he, like Jake said, like he's just always one of them players. Like no matter what, his name is gonna always be in trade rumors. You know, like I don't care. I don't, me personally, I don't see it when you when you have a lot of bigs that are not as talented, not as skilled as him on the block, and teams are like loving him and and they're in love with him. And then you get like a legit one like that, and his name is always coming up in trade rumors. Like. Yes, that's just a part of business I never understand. But what if the Raptors? Because you know, I I always got to bring it back yeah. to the Raptors, fellas. I just somehow, some way, the Raptors might be interested in them. Let's say they do a Valanciunas for for a favor swap. What do you guys think? Well, I take that. You got a player Jake. that's making less money and he's more effective on the floor. I see you thinking over there, Jake. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think it works business wise, but I don't think him and Ibaka together is that more intimidating than him and Valanciunas together? I think it works for the for the Raptors. Yes, yeah. if I'm the Raptors, I take that trade. <laughs> but then, yeah, you get two centers with Gobert and yeah, the Jazz. Valanciunas, yeah. two cement feet guys. Because, yeah. like Alvin was saying, once you get rid of Favors, who's going to come off? Even if you have Valanciunas come off the bench, who's your starting power forward? Yeah, you're kind of got a hole yeah, there. You're true. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess trading for Favors. I don't. I feel sorry for the guy. I guess, but anyways, moving on to the Cavaliers and the Clippers. There's rumors, fellas. Rumors that you want to wait for. Or you want me to get to it? I'll get to it. DeAndre Jordan for. We've already talked about this in the summertime. DeAndre Jordan for um, Thompson. Jesus, what's his first name? I'm having Tristan, Tristan Thompson. Thompson. Oh. Jesus, crummies. I wanted to say Clay Thompson. I'm like that just doesn't. You just got all your players mixed up. I'm getting the Ryan Anderson, Ryan, Ryan Anderson, Anderson, Alex Anderson, <laughs> Kyle Anderson thing again. But anyways, DeAndre Jordan for Tristan Thompson. Now the Clippers want that pick from the Nets. Everyone wants that pick. That's a highly coveted, touted little piece of piece of equipment you got there with the Brooklyn Nets, 12th in the Eastern Conference, right? The Cavaliers are saying no. They need to have um, some reassurance in case LeBron James leaves. They don't want to have, you know, if he parts ways, they have no reassurance. They got no insurance policy. What do you guys feel? Is the DeAndre Jordan for Tristan Thompson swap going to work? They're going to have to put in an Amon Shumpert because DeAndre Jordan makes more money, I believe. I think he's at like $23 million or something like that, and yeah. Tristan Thompson's only about seventeen. I don't know. I might be able to figure something out. But what do you guys feel? Um, I, I I agree with you. It's it's a tough one for both sides, you know. Of course, across the board, I'm a, I do that, you know, with the Tristan Thompson for DeAndre Jordan, just for what DeAndre Jordan brings to the team. I think he'll compliment him a lot because when you I have think the a, Clippers you, would lose that trade. You know, when you have a big like DeAndre Jordan that can block a shot, rebound, and run the floor the way he does, it makes the game easier for LeBron. The pitch ups to your big dunking it, he running from paint to paint. You know, he can, like on a pick and roll, he sets that pick, you can put it in the air, he's going to go get it, you know, and he's <laughs> scrapping and stuff. And it gives you a rim protector as well. But you give up that pick and then LeBron say, I'm out, you know, and you got nothing, now you, really. you have nothing. So you got Jeff like, Green stepping into your starting small forward position. Yeah, You're going to have um, about $20 million, $25 million in cap space. Yeah. But at the same time, that's a hard free agent pitch to go, okay, LeBron James has left. Come step into his shoes, please, Paul George. Yeah, so it's, I'm it's, going to Lakers piece. <laughs> or I'm staying in Oklahoma City piece. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, Jake Gup? I think Tristan likes that trade to L.A. Oh, of course he does. <laughs> He's going to be a regular on the Kardashian show. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it comes down to the pick and DeAndre Jordan. You got to weigh if you want DeAndre Jordan, or if you want a Marvin Bagley, Trey Young, Michael Ooh. Michael Porter Jr. Um, I like your thinking. There. You got to weigh it uh, for the Cavs. Like you, like both of you said. Well, you're in GM mode, Jacob. Yes. Well, you're the Cavs GM right now. Cavs GM, you got away. Uh, LeBron hasn't given you a go ahead if he's going to come back or not. From what we've been told, yes. From what we've been told, so I think you push for that before you push for a trade because you need that insurance policy. Yeah. Personally, I mean, you can't. Do you, let's do say you, he leaves. You, LeBron James leaves. How do you bring someone in, right? Yeah. Do you want DeAndre Jordan and no LeBron James though? Uh, With the, I, I, think, I think it can still work a little bit. Or, you know, for the time. They're not going to be a, a, a yeah. finals contender. For the time, for, they'll still for the be a contender being, in the East. You know, yeah. Yeah, be Maybe a, like a – so you don't have the pick, too. So if you have DeAndre Jordan, you won't have the pick. So DeAndre Jordan and Isaiah Thomas, that's your squad. 
Those are your guys. And Dwayne Wade's probably going to peace Dwayne out Wade, too, yeah. won't he? Yeah. He might go back to Miami. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah, true. So, so you yeah. got to wait if that. Well, he might finish his it. career. He might pull a Paul Pierce and sign a one day contract to have him. Oh, before. Sure. But, anyways, that's. <laughs> Well, that's a very vague statement he says, right? He's like, I want to finish my career in Miami. Yeah. I'm sure that's what everyone wants. Do like Paul Pierce. One day with Boston. Just does a one day little thing. But overall, I don't think that trade's going to go through. Cleveland needs that pick. They need that pick. Kevin Durant, guys. He's the second youngest player to score 20,000 points. Yeah. Good. Good And he's joined some elite company fellas. Wilt Chamberlain, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. Who is the youngest to do it? And I already know Jake looked at the screen, so there's a good one. Well, I'm, I'm going to say, <laughs> you're the youngest to score 20,000? Yeah. Was, would it be Braun? What do you think, Jacob? He looked at the screen. It's LeBron James. I actually yeah. I didn't even see that. Where is it? <laughs> it's LeBron James. Oh, okay. Right but yeah, LeBron James was the youngest. Kevin Durant, second youngest. Questions this, fellas. Is Kevin Durant going to be a top five scorer all time? He's on pace. He's top on five. pace. Yeah, he's on pace, but right now Youngest he's on pace. Youngest scoring champ ever. Yeah, he's Tracy on, McGrady was he, that too. But y'all got to look at the back end, though, man. Like, does he keep That's this up? That's what I mean, Tracy McGrady was Yeah, but does he keep this up for another seven, eight years? You get what I'm saying? Like, Kareem uh, Abdul-Jabbar, he averaged uh, what was almost 20 points a game when he was 40 years old. So he's got to pretty much do that because yeah, at least uh, Carl Malone, his last year with the Utah Jazz, was 17 and 10. Okay, and the thing that's crazy about that is the two guys that you just named were both they were the power forward, player. and they were a center. Never so they threes. never had to shoot threes. They didn't have to chase people on the perimeter. They didn't have to work as much to create shots. You give it to Kareem, he's going to give you a dribble sky hook. Carl yep. Malone going to get you in the post finish. Pick and pop. Pick and pop. Knock down, pick and, pop, down, line, pick yeah. and roll. Him and John Stockton used to run that. They almost killed the Bulls with a simple pick and roll. Seriously. So the, the, the company that you do saying that with him, with the, the two leaders are both bigs. So, you know, can KD come down at – at 37, 30, you know, 36, 37, 38 years old and break down defense and pull up jump shots and, you know, all that stuff and just get it off like that because, <laughs> like they say, man, that, that sports is a young man's game. So when he comes in and you got those young guys, in they're, seven constantly, years, yeah, and they're constantly coming at you. You, could, you know, you, you never want to put this on nobody, but that's why I kind of, like, grimace when people start trying to say that stuff. Because 30,000 points cream scored, yeah. 32,000. So you look at it and then, you, you know, 12, how long is KD? He came in at, what, 2008? He's been in the league around 10 years. Okay, yes. so and he's at 20, right? Quickly. So you say give him another 10 year. Like another, he's basically got to average 20 points a game until he's 40. Yeah, that's, what Kareem that's did. what he's pretty much got to do. You Kareem's know? last I, year, he was 10 and 10 yeah, when he was just, 41. Yeah, I just don't really see him putting up 20 for the next 10 years. That's pretty you, tough. You know, that's tough. Like, that is Especially tough. with the more athletic defenders coming in. But I see you thinking, Jake. What are you thinking? Well, I think a guy like Melo, he's the only active player to average 20 points per game over his career. This year, this season he's not so that that yeah. that streaks can be broken but i don't Very think point, mellow's actually. even in the conversation for top five scorer all time and i think kd is a mellow like scorer and mellow's put up these numbers over 20 points per game for 15 years 16 yeah, years? 15 yeah. years and this will be a 16th season yeah i think he ends up well kevin durant has a much more has a better career than mellow um better so far, overall yeah. play style so far yeah uh so i think he kind of goes out like mellow in the sense where he just goes down as an all-time great scorer, but I'm not necessarily sure if he's in the top. Gentlemen, what if he does this though? This is where it's this is where it's decisive for me. If he can do what Kobe Bryant did his last five years and start working in the mid post, yeah, if he can start doing that, he's here. Here's the thing: he's got to take it smart. He's got to make it make it smart in that he can't. Um, just keep trying to be 37 year old Kevin Durant and then be like I'm 27 at my heart I could still you know bop 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 and go to the rim and just dunk on someone he's gonna have to go and try and get those easy buckets and that's where Colin Malone and that's where Kareem Abdul-Jabbar I think excelled in getting their their buckets that way because when they started getting over 35 their style of play was transparent or trans it transformed that way into being able to get easy buckets on the block a little sky hook here a little still sets the pick and roll and goes towards the basket you know what I mean yeah, this is. I get what you're saying, but you look at the era too, right? Like Kobe, he he, he was a footwork like master, right? Yes. He he knew how to get his shot off regardless. So it was like the rare game where he was going against the Kevin Durant or the LeBron. So for the most part, he had guards that was like his size, right? So he could do that. Nowadays, dudes, guards are coming out bigger. They're coming out stronger and taller, mm-hmm. man. So it it is you know you take it another six seven years down the road, you know uh, it's 
KD able to turn and get that mid-range off against a team that's stacked with, like, guys coming in like Giannis or whatnot. 6'11", 6'10", 6'11". Because that's the new small forward three, powerful. Yeah, two and three guards. You get what I'm saying? Like, is he able to comfortably get that off like that? I'm not saying he can't. It's just that at the efficiency that he's doing it at now, it's going to drop, man. Like, that's just a, it's a fact. Um, the other thing I was wondering is this. Um, look at a guy like Jimmy Butler. When Jimmy Butler came into the NBA, so it's 6'7". Oh, Jasmine, you were just so vocal. Charlie, one day, you the other. Anyways, Jimmy Butler started off as a small forward. He's a shooting guard now. Yeah. And I know he had to transition into that. I know he had to you know work on his dribbling skills and his passing ability and stuff like that. But... That seems like it's more with that's more how the NBA's evolved from Jimmy Butler coming into the league in 2011, 2012, in just six, six seven years, right? Mm -hmm. He's yeah, he's evolved that way. But it's yeah. just it's the work he put in, man. Like Jimmy Butler came in, and he was known for defense. Yep. Like don't get me wrong, he was known for <laughs> that that guy that can get out in transition and finish in defense. It, it was up until Jimmy Butler said, you know what, if I want to be considered on this level with these other guys, I got to expand my game. And he got in the gym and he worked. That's why I respect this game so much. Yeah. He got in the gym and he worked on it. And it's back. I know it's kind of off, but it's it's back to the whole Robeson thing. Dude, I cannot see <laughs> why he's not able to consistently knock down a jump shot <sighs> if he's supposed to be putting in the work. Jimmy Butler's able to do it. Elvin, so if I Baca's pay you $10 million dollars a year over four years and I say, look, I need you to go from – flipping 20% from three to just respectable 30% from three. That's not unreasonable, is it? No, it's not, dude. I mean, it's just, to be honest with you, if I'm making 10 a year, I'm like the next contract. I want to be contract, a, right? I want to be at least making 15. The only way I'm going to make 15 is being efficient and be like reliable. You got, I'm going to tell you what's crazy. Because they're not going to pay you more money for the yeah, same and product. No, they're not, not with the league going the way it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, And the thing about it, I'm going to tell you a, a, store, a show, um, player wasn't like great at creating shots, but he played in the league for years. You remember Eric Snow? Eric Snow. And all he did was he facilitated. He and facilitated, Cavs. and when they gave him the ball at 18 foot, he knocked down a jump shot. Sean Livingston. They didn't, they didn't ask him on the team with Iverson and them. They didn't ask him to come down and score 20 a night. When Iverson pitched it to him, when they doubled or whatnot, and he was wide open, he took the shot. 50% of the time, he was knocking it down. Like, dude, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like, that's where it's at. But right about now, the NBA has catered so much to specialists. The guys don't really work on their craft anymore. They like, you know what? This is what I do. I've I made the it. money off of this. I got the to be honest with followers, you, baby. Yeah, I was laying down the other night and I was thinking, dude, and I was looking at him play, dude. Why would you get rid of Tabo? I mean, he could at least shoot the ball. You he get what I'm saying? Solid he was too, a solid defender. Good, yeah. Like, so why would you get rid of Stephalosha to keep? Robeson like that. You get what I'm saying? Like, and you get I the same understand. product, and you're only going to have to pay him $3 million, <laughs> like, $5 million bucks, half your money. Tabo's another one of those guys that came in and wasn't really known as a shooter sure. either. No, yeah. he, he developed into yeah. a shooter. And, he, and when they, if you think back when they used He's to play, the back when they used to play, when they played the Lakers, they put him on Kobe. When they played Cavs, yeah. they put him on Bulls. When he was on the Bulls, when they when played, yeah, yeah, when they played teams, they didn't put KD on them guys. They put Tabo on them. Man. Like, like Tony Allen with a jump shot. Yeah. Tony Allen, better defender, though. But, yeah, very good act. Very good apples and oranges kind of thing you know very comparable um even though apples and oranges i guess aren't comparable either way shut up ethan anyways um so portland and houston played last night houston um i don't have too much game info on this one i didn't did a little enough research on myself personally sorry yeah. but i know portland won the game 121 112 yeah chris paul had 37 70, see i was watching the clippers game to be honest with you but yeah. yeah yeah he did it and dame lilla had 29 so Damian Battle Lillard, of the point guards, man. Unsung hero for the for the Western Conference. Not going to yeah. get enough love. If he was in the Eastern Conference, oh, he would have he would be on the cover of like I know it, man. It just it just one of them, a cool he magazine. Fall, <laughs> yeah, he falls behind a James Harden, a Chris Paul, a Steph Curry. Like it's just unfortunate for him, dude. Like I feel bad for the dude to be honest with you, man. Yeah, <laughs> like, but is it that bad because it's like cry for me? I'm making twenty seven million dollars. No, it's not like cry. Like because you, I'm gonna tell you what. At first, you could tell it bothered him. Now he's just on a mission. You know what I'm saying? And that's what you can respect. He's not like going to social media. You know, wanting to get everybody involved. He's just like you know what? Like I'm here. To he play just wants basketball. to be on an all the NBA team, doesn't I'm, he? No, he's just like I'm here to play. I'm here to win, and everything else will take care of itself, right? Because at the end of the day. Everybody knows that Dame Lillard can go. And everybody knows he's being snubbed year in and year out. We all know that. I just don't get, like, you know, I don't get what the NBA is saying. <laughs> like, to yeah. be honest with you, man. But So, I was watching the Timberwolves. I'm very, very fond of them this year. Yeah. Jimmy Butler turning himself into a prolific scorer as well as an elite defender still. 
Jeff T coming back from injury, so they're just you know getting getting him worked out. Carl Anthony Towns last night against the Thunder started off like zero for four, had a very rough start. Yeah, it's all right though. That's where it failed for them last year. That's why they only won like not even thirty games because. Would Carl Anthony Towns would have a rough start? There was nothing to go for. They got Taj Gibson supporting him. They got Jeff Teague, Shabazz Muhammad off the bench, Tyus Jones off the bench, Jamal Crawford off the bench. They got the perfect team for Tom Thibodeau because he loves. He's not afraid to use his bench. That's why those Bulls teams were very competitive when he was a coach there. Yeah. Even though he would use his starters a lot, he still had a few guys he would always trust, and he held them accountable too. You know, like that. Well, that's what Jimmy Butler, yeah. they've said compared to last year or this year. And I'm not even mentioning Andrew Wiggins. Yeah. Andrew Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns, they're like, we noticed something different with Jimmy Butler when we were playing the Sacramento Kings. And Jimmy Butler hit this tough step back three, and it put them up like two points with 30 seconds to go. And then he just looked right at the Sacramento bench, and he's like, none of you guys can guard me. Yeah. And they're like, that arrogance and that confidence he is did rubbing that, off. And he did that against um, Denver, too. Yeah. Went on with Jamal Murray. He just he looks come right down at him. Bap, no. bap and hit him, and he's like, you can't. But to be honest with you, man, a, a team like that, they need. You need that. You need players like that. You need, he's perfect for you Tom need, Thibodeau, like, But you too. need good. That's why I was like, some of these teams, I'm like, some of these teams need good, proven veterans. Some you grit. get what I'm saying? Like, they need somebody who's been through the trenches, but can still get in the trenches and fight with you every night. You get what I'm saying? That's what they need. And they got that in Jimmy Butler. Like, he can do it on both ends of the floor. You get what I'm saying? So he's not a liability out there. So when you. When you got a team like that, and your your leader, your vet is stepping up like that, yeah. the younger guys got to follow suit, man. Like yep. you have to. It's not a good look. You get what I'm saying? So, you know, it's a shout out to him, man, for that one. All right, Jacob, Sweet Lou Williams of the Clippers. He had 50 points last night, 27 in the third quarter. Elvin and I were talking about this. I want to know your opinion before we get into the Clippers win, 125-106. Why did the Raptors not keep Lou Williams? I know. There's a lot of stuff the Raptors do. We don't know why. I, that's <laughs> why I should be the GM. Um, Next question. Anyway, sorry. Did he get a payday with Clippers? Uh, I think he's averaging about $7 million because yeah, he like said... 21. He got like a three-year. Three years, 21, yeah. It's $21 million. And um, they wound up trading it off. When the Raptors had him for sixth man of the year... I said their backcourt in the second unit wasn't very good because nobody plays defense. They can score. That didn't mean get rid of Lou Williams. He was your scorer. Yeah. I meant get rid of Grievous Vasquez and put someone in there that could actually play defense. So if you add him, Lou Williams, and, and Norman Powell together, let's say as an example, that's a pretty solid second unit. If you have Lou Williams as your de facto point guard and let, let either of them figure out who's the point guard, or him and DeLon Wright, for instance, because DeLon Wright's got the length, he's got the defense, Lou Williams can score. He's not the greatest defender. But he brings more to the table off the bench. My question is this, fellers. He said the Raptors, if they would have offered him a three-year, $15 million deal, or just five a year for whatever, he would have stayed. Would you guys have offered that deal? he be honest with you. If I'm the GM, he probably would have got more for what he brings, man. It, it, I thought he was going to get dude, seven to ten personally. But that's what I'm saying, man. Like... At that point in time, we was talking about the Raptors, and they did not have an identity. They always tried to run off of whatever worked for the team the year previous, yep. right? So, oh, this worked. This the the you know the the you know the spread the floor with four shooters thing worked for Golden State. Oh, we're gonna do it this year. Like they didn't get an There's identity. There's a guy in Italy who does yeah. that. But that's, <laughs> when a guy like Lou Williams, man, you find a way to make it work with him. Yeah, like that dude is like you know he's not. It's not a fluke. He's putting up the numbers he's doing. So regardless, if you come in and he you was see, the leading score of the Lakers, he last can year. he can he can score on the ball. He can score off the ball, right? So you find out what's working that night, and you put him in that situation. All right, Lou, they're they're not good at playing off the ball defense, so we're gonna play you off the ball. And he they're doesn't not, start very often, does he, yeah. Jake? It's like, no, he's he's like I think historically he's a bench guy. Yeah. Even despite the numbers he puts up. Yeah, which is fine because that means your second unit's got a power punch in the back. Yeah. And like I said, if he was with the Raptors right now, and he we have him and Delon Wright, him and Norm, him Delon Wright and Norman Powell as our three guys, you know, point guard, shooting guard, small forward, that's pretty good. Him and Siakam and Pirtle, that's a pretty solid second unit. Then you don't have, then you know where your scoring is going to come from. You're yeah. going to get your scoring from Powell, and you're going to get your scoring from Lou Williams. Yeah, because so you, Lou. you got four guys out there, four hustle players with a guy who can fill it up. Like, dude, that's a perfect bench right there because. Yeah. Let's be real. Sometimes you look at it from a professional standpoint, and even though you say, yeah, Lou Williams should be starting, as a coach, if I got DeRozan and all them, I would bring Lou Williams off the bench. That way you can always cool have – you don't yeah. want to go to the bench and lose. You don't want to go to the bench and just 
completely fall have off, no yeah. scoring option. You fall completely off and stuff like that. So it would have been like to me that would have been like a perfect situation for Toronto, especially when they start talking about, oh, we need to work on spreading the floor and we need three point shooters. And what you how have somebody who can knock them, yeah. the ball. Down. I I haven't <laughs> looked this up yet, but how many fifty point games does Kyle Lowry have? Just saying, just if we're gonna compare guard for guard here, no, and has, I know they're apples and oranges, absolutely but nothing because up before DeRozan just scored this fifty two. Terrence Ross was the top, right? He no, was, it, was, was, it was it was Vince Carter. No, he I'm just saying though. Prior, I'm talking yeah, about since Vince Carter. Prior to it was his his high score was, is like 42 points for Kyle yeah. Lowry. And that was like against a, the Suns. And that's last a blazing night for Kyle was, Lowry. Like he didn't fall on the floor now, and I don't think the refs, you know, they gave him every call. So he, he was, probably bought them all a Rolex before <laughs> early in the season too. Yeah, so. um, we had him. We let him go. What can we do? Oh well. All right. John Gruden's back with the Raiders. Boom, boom, boom. Tampa 2 defense, but I guess it'll be called the Oakland 2 defense, Johnny. Ah, anyways, that was a bad joke. Gentlemen, we have some NBLC news to get through, and then we're going to be all wrapped up. Okay, so it's Tuesday night. I watched the Lithuania game with those Lamelo and LiAngelo Ball kids. Look, we'll get to the Better Business Bureau ratings in a second. Settle down, Jake. Anyways, Carl English is frustrated, Jacob. Why is Carl English frustrated? Uh, like most of the big name players in this league, refereeing. Elvin. A lot yeah. of the fans, too, actually. You played in the NBLC? Yep. These are your jerseys behind us? Yeah. You wore number four for the London Lightning? Uh-huh. I would like an honest answer out of you, please, and thank you. I know you are a very polite man, but what do you think of the refing in these parts or for the NBLC compared to other leagues you've played in? Uh, for the most part, man, I... Uh, it's it's kind of it's so poor, to be honest with you, man. Like when I was playing in the NBLC, what would happen, man? Is you take a lot of these refs, and I think they're used to refing like high school games and such, and they're not able to understand the physicality that comes in a man's professional game. So what I found that would happen, even when I was playing, and I mean Jacob probably can probably agree with this, is that the ref have in their mind they pretty much premeditatively make a call. Like, they see a guy going to the basket, and they see everybody shifting over. Their hand's you, already up. No, you can go on and raise your hand like you're going to swipe at the ball, and just and they'll just blow the, blow the you know. And then at that point, they got to go through with the call, right? Because you know, you've already I, got your hand up. It's just with me, I've never been like, you know, if I didn't appreciate, you know, calls that refs, I've never been just like put them on blast. But, like, don't get me wrong. I put a, or I've had a ref or two, you know, coming out of a timeout or at halftime that I stood over to them and, like, gave them hell. You know what I'm saying? Like, dude, like, because at the time when I was when I was playing, the worst call, dude, was charges. Like, you can let a guy would be outside or inside the charging lane, still moving, and because he flops over, they're like, oh, it's a charge. His it's feet were charge. there. It's a charge. And I'm like, dude, he's inside this restricted area. Yeah. I don't care if he's planted here and I run over him. What's the purpose of the restricted I area? I don't mean to speak on your behalf, but if I remember correctly when we first started hanging out, because I've brought this question up to you before because yeah. it's been on the NBL fan page. Is it, if I remember correctly, didn't you have to send in some footage to prove to the refs that you weren't goaltending? No, it was when I was in Australia that happened. Dude, I, was, I went from, like, honestly, that was, like, one of the most frustrating things, dude, because I went from, like, being known as, like, a good defender to, like, filing out of games in, like, 13 minutes. Jesus. And it was, like, frustrating. They was, like, literally had to send footage in. And, like, I mean, they they, they, they sent an apology Wrong to the NBL, organization sorry. and all that stuff and was just, like, you know, hey, Josh, you know, this guy, is, you know, he's getting, like, bad calls and stuff or, you know, things like that. But, yeah, that was frustrating. And it happens. But I think with the NBLC, man, like, I think just, like, number one, when they have these combines, like, they should have the refs there, like, refing. They should do, like, clinics. Even if the NBLC have to take up a little money and send, you know, try to see if they can send refs down to – to you know learn different things and go to like ref and clinics and stuff like that but you just you you can't take a high school ref that coach that ref the high school game monday night and throw him out and say ref a grown man yeah but he's been doing the western night. games and he's done the men's league games yeah, but it's the game is like dude in western games men's league high school dude you don't have a, a rush right on anthony stover type players battling down low you don't have you know guys like you know Anthony Anderson that knows yeah. how to use screens and and big guys that knows how because now what they're what they thinking is not a game is sold on a lot of acting you know it's a lot of acting I get I hit you with a good screen you act like I almost killed you the first thing they do oh he flick he, your neck back oh man he had to, he looked like he almost got killed that guy had to follow him you know and it's just yeah. like that man I 
let them play. You know what I'm saying? Like, I had a ref tell me one time, like, I, well, I'm like, dude, that's terrible. Well, how do I stop it? Let him get ran over a couple of times. Let him get ran over a couple of times. You don't blow that wheel, so I promise you, the next charge he takes will be a legit charge. You know what I'm saying? Like, stuff like that. But I can feel the frustration from players and fans alike, man, with this because it's been an ongoing thing. Like, well, ref, they literally dictating games. Like, you Here's know. what happened, fellas. I got some information for you, Jacob, and then I, I got a question on how they're going to fix this. So there's six minutes left in the fourth quarter. The Edge were playing the Windsor Express. They lost the game 101 or 111, sorry, 103. Carl English and Greg Parsons were having a little go at each other. Carl, uh, Greg Parsons, you having fun, Callan? Anyways, Greg Parsons um, seems to be under fire. He's given four technicals and four games to Carl English. He went to the reporters. He said he was very frustrated. Everything's horrendous. It's garbage. It's trash. Jacob, how are they fixing these things? Well, the league's come out and said they're going to ship refs in. From? Uh, actually, you... I didn't read that far in. Uh, just... I believe it's from the Central Division, eh? Oh, okay. Or yeah. Or is it from like, Nova Scotia? That's what I was curious. I was wondering if and when we're going to try and bring in some D-League refs. <sighs> is that the answer? What, I see Elvin going, ugh. What's I the, uh... do it because... Is it any I, better? I, I think if they bring D League refs in, then I think all of a sudden people are going to start crying about the fact that the game is too physical. Then, because these D League refs are used to NBA style players, the NBA style play. They got to get used to the whole and being the FIBA rule, being able to knock it off. They got to get used to players not being able to call timeouts while falling out of bounds uh, while they can't. Yeah, like the true. rules are different. That they got to go from, you know, you got to think if you're getting ready to fall out of bounds. And you can't call timeout. No. Let's say you're about to get a five second count on the inbound, and you say timeout, and he give it to you. That gives you another five seconds to reset. You're not supposed to do. You that, get what yeah. I'm saying? You can't. So it's gonna. It's like one of those catch things. All the D League refs able to transition back, you know, over to the FIBA rules back and forth kind of. So thing. they they got a okay. So then here's what I think could be a solution. Then you've already said the clinics and stuff like that, and I agree. I think they need to bring in then some f- top level FIBA guys. Is that what they need to do? Bring in some big FIBA names yeah. to help teach some guys some things. Either that or just like. Just like they break down film with players, you you can probably even if you don't bring them in, you find top level FIBA refs that's been doing it for years overseas. You reach out and say, "Yo, can we send you footage of our officiating and, we'll and tell us what do it, you yeah. see wrong with it?" And they can probably get feedback. Hey, the, you, you know your refs are. We notice that they're more prone to call this when it's in this situation. They could probably and then you know where to start attacking problems. At least it's a start. You know to start. You know, we're not saying the refs are completely horrendous, right, Jake? No, I think a lot of the time. And Carl English said this, and a lot of myself and a lot of other fans agree, is refs are calling fouls out of position. That was the big thing exactly. with Carl. That's why he got yep, so frustrated, yep. is Greg Parsons was standing beside him. He was looking. They made eye contact watching, according to Carl English, yeah, yes. was watching uh, Shaquille Keith body up. Bump, 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 yeah. bump, bump, bump. I was watching it too, it yeah. It had to be the ref on the other end of the court that called. Yeah. yeah. That's when I've, you know something's up. Trust yeah. me, I have seen that too. Like, I've seen players drive baseline. And the ref at the top calls the foul when it's a ref right yeah. down baseline. <laughs> and then we like, dude, go to him and let him know that that's your call at least. You like, it's no way that you got you got ten grown men on the floor, and then, you know, and a ref behind the, all the action blows the whistle when one in front of it sees nothing. Like, yes, I've seen that happen plenty of times, man. Um, in case anyone's wondering, Kellen's sitting in. He's our little super fan, yeah, right, Kellen? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's all good. Is it personal, fellas? Elvin, I'm going to go with you first just because you're the former player. Is it personal, do you think? Or do you think the refs just, it just happens to be the right place, the right time, so to say, for both play, both parties here? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the the, the history of it. I'm going to tell you another player that used to get bad breaks too, man. And it, it was all because of body language of how he used to do it. And it was like DeAndre Thomas, right? Like, Really? He used to get a bad break with the referees. And it was like, it's you know, and a guy that I played with, they used to be the same way. I've seen him get a lot like Tim Ellis, right? Because he was a passionate player and stuff. I used to see, you know, refs just like he couldn't say anything. If he even looked at him wrong, he'd get a tech or whatnot. You know, so... Some of them do take it personal, but as a ref, I feel like as a ref, you cannot say I want to be an official and be sensitive or have soft skin, dude. Because no matter how you blow that whistle, somebody there's going to be some emotion. So it's like, do you make your call? You know what I'm saying? And you'd be done. Like I can respect a ref if he say, you know what? I don't want nobody but the team captain talking to me. You know Establish from the get go. You know Establish from the get go. Yeah. You know I want nobody but the team captain. So anything after that, you at least you say, you know what? I told him. 
I want nobody but the team captain. Like, and then it's done. But, you know, some refs do. You know, they have a chip on their shoulder just like everybody else, right? So, Well, Jacob, just like I asked Elvin, you think it's personal. That's I think it's I oh, think sorry. it's four and four games. There's yeah. something That's there. what triggers me, to be same honest. It's four and four player. games, and yeah. I, I don't want to call it the refs like Carl English did, but <laughs> four and four games, he ignored the call right in front of him, and then when he was... That's the confusing part. And when he got called out for it, he tossed him out of the game. Because so, those are all the factors for me. If you had a little pro and con list of was it personal or not, he's out of position, four texts in four games. Same player. Same player. Same ref giving yeah. four texts to the same player in four games. Jake, do you sit this referee down if you're Oddly Stevenson and say, okay, what's going on? Or do you have a conversation over the phone? Do I don't think, think Oddly Stevenson does it. I think Mike Falloon, director of officiating, uh, probably should get involved. Yes, but is Oddly Stevenson involved because of J- of Carl English going to the papers, so to say? I think I think uh, Oddly and... Does it go above? I think Oddly and Mike have a discussion about it. And then Mike... He does his job? Yeah, Mike does his job. I will say this, though. English is a talker. He does like I've to. I've seen him, like, <laughs> I posted this on the fan page of early in the season. He he was going at it with a fan. The fan gave him the finger in the game. But Carlin, he talks. He talks with everybody. He so I think fun. it's a matter of um, he got under the ref skin, I think. And it's been four and four games. El- Elvin said, if, if you're going to get under your skin, don't be ref. How does he handle it properly, then, Elvin? Who? What do you think he should do? Who? Carl English. Uh, Instead of going to the papers and saying they're horrendous, they're garbage, they can't keep up, they're calling them out of position, he has very valid points. Yeah, you have valid points. Meaning, but. what I think is, does he get? Does he go to the video guy and say, okay, I need you, I don't care if i got to pay you or whatever, I need you to go and put a little piece together for me, and i got to talk to Oddly Stevenson, or i got to talk to, what's his name again, Mike? Mike, oh, Feldman. You go to, Mike yeah, Feldman. Yeah, you go to, Eric, you go to your, your coaches, um, yeah. you go your GMs. Follow the chain of command? Yeah, you do that and let them go about doing that. You focus on playing basketball. You know, you don't want to, as a as a player, you know, you don't want to get that target on your back. Wherever where you go, they got that eye on you because you're calling out officials. You let you let the the head people take care of that, and you just play. You focus on playing basketball. Like, trust me, I get the frustration. Like, we get it. You've but been there at, before, haven't yeah. You? But at some point, like, you know, you you got to find out how to channel that right and to to go to the papers and, and criticize the officiating. I don't personally think that that's the way. I mean, you can sit in the locker room amongst teammates, coaches, owners, and every way and and, yeah. and bash them to death if you want to. That's all within you know the, that organization. But when it's time to you know do stuff like that publicly or whatnot, that's for the coaches, the GMs, the owners to step forth and do that. So, yes, and. They played again last night, and it was under a little more control. It wasn't as physical. You know, Carl English kind of kept his head, which was good. He was a professional. He's still scoring in buckets at 36. Him and Anthony Anderson, 20 points last night, mm-hmm. five boards, six assists. That's pretty efficient for a guy at 36 years old. Because they know how to play. It's the difference between playing and knowing how to yeah, play. Look at it's right like, here. I kid you not, dude. That's what separates a lot of players on a professional level, dude. It's not talent. It's not being able to run and jump. It's the mental? It's the mental aspect, yeah. dude. It's, it's, the, it's the basketball IQ. If you look at Anthony Anderson, dude, he can't jump. It's not like Anthony Anderson's just out athletic, and, you know, just going out and just out jumping people, and he's faster than people. But he knows how to position himself. He knows how to use a screen. He knows how to get you in foul trouble, dude. That's all. He He's... he's at that point, Carl English and, and both Anthony Anderson are at the point to where they're literally two and three steps ahead of everybody mentally. So he comes off. He's not even worried about the screen. He's thinking about what he's doing after he's he comes off of it. Yeah, and he knows what's happening, right? Like, And, and like, dude, I think, that honestly, that's actually good for the NBC this year to have a couple of like older guys like that, that are, that's putting in work. You know, because at one point, I think they was trying to cater more to just being like a young, dominated league. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, you know, I mean, you have players like that, that that can put in work, like we said with Jimmy Butler, right? When you have a guy that's 35, 36, and he can put in work, dude, that's like it helps out like all your younger guys. It's true. A whole it, lot. It they, sets the as, a, as a basketball player, you respect that. I had, I had to, I was lucky enough to come into a situation like that when I first started playing. Well, Gucci whole, Norris, correct? No, it was doing that Anthony Goldwire at the time. Oh. He was 35. You know, we had dude, we had like three or four of our starting five lineup that was 35 years old, and we won a championship that year, dude. I learned a lot from them, dude. You know, so, you know, I think that's a good thing, you know, like I said, overall for the league to have guys like that. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to go to the question period quickly here. Mm-hmm. 
We're going to keep it short and sweet. I want to wrap this up in about five minutes and get her uh, gear going. So, fellas, I noticed was it Mason Hall commenting about the Better Bu- Business Bureau when I shared that about uh, on oh, the God, uh, Mason. Yeah, he's a nice, cool fella. He's yeah. a cool cat. I tagged him in a cool cereal post. But anyways, um, oh, it was uh, Oreo cereal. It's pretty sick. Anyways, um, for the Better Business Bureau giving Big Baller Brand an F, which is the lowest rating you can get. <laughs> he's got zero prospects <laughs> for... <laughs> We give you a new rating, G- three Bs, and that's not good. Anyways, um, he's got no prospects of investors. No one wants to give him give him their money. Rightfully so. People are ordering shoes like Dan Lebetard, well known celebrities who order shoes, got the wrong size and wrong color, and spent a thousand dollars for two pairs of shoes. So people are paying very good money, and their reviews are terrible. And it's pretty much the Better Business Bureau is the only one. They don't have to disclose the numbers, but from what they've said, is no, they don't have a lot of money sold from their product. Yeah. It's an idea that was very cool, and I'm sure if he was a little bit more of a humbled man and put the shoes at around 150 bucks, 120 bucks, under $200 tops, he would have a little bit more money being made because he's not going to get any sales in Canada. I'm not paying $500 U.S., plus shipping to get the wrong size and wrong flipping color for shoes mm-hmm. just to be like sweet I'm a big baller go Lonzo I feel so cool like, I'm not paying that in might as well do it for the vine because that's how cool I <laughs> yeah. feel I mean dude when, you, when you're paying that much for anything dude you're expecting it to come primed like you're not looking for any problems. better be in like a wooden golden case like, yeah, you're not looking for my any, name like, on honestly, it honestly you're not looking for any problems dude. a little like, letter signed by all the ball family saying thank you for like, giving us you, your yeah, money so when you're doing that man and your price and stuff like that like you got to make sure especially customer become satisfaction correct. becomes priority one you know you're all the sneakerheads sure, are giving like, them terrible reviews for performance on the court too they don't yeah. have lonzo doesn't wear them all the time that should tell you <laughs> so, something does yeah. that mean enough but, jacob what do you think I think at that price tag, it's got to have a Jordan logo on it. Uh, even that, I'm kind of going, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry, dude. They got to have a Jesus logo on it. <laughs> Put a Jesus fish. 500, I got to see. They got to have a logo on, you know, walking on water. I saw it, I got to have glide. it on the band, but. Well, I know early in production, they actually switched. Uh, they partnered with a company called Brand Black. It's okay. It's not super popular. They have, like, some sandals and stuff, but that that didn't even save it from the BBB. No. Or themselves, actually. And the so. Better Business Bureau. Get it? Because they have triple Bs, too. They're like, we're the real company with triple Bs. <laughs> Anyways, if you're getting an F from them, that's not reassuring. I like to. I didn't look it up, but I'm, I should have, and it just popped into my head right now. But I should have looked up what LeBron James's pizza chain um, rating is from the Better Business Bureau because it was one of the fastest-growing pizza chains when he put it out, and yeah. I'm I sure it's a very, very good investment. But anyways, is there any more questions, Jacob? Uh, actually, yeah, on the fan group. We had a question. Let me pull it up. Ozzy Driscoll was asking if we wanted to make a comment on the Nelson Taroba versus Anthony Stober drama going on. I'm going to let you take John the lead on this one, Jacob. Yeah. So for those who don't really know the situation, um, Anthony Stober, all, second all-time leader in uh, shot blocking behind Cavell Johnson. Um one of the most prolific defensive players in league history, defensive player of the year uh, a couple years ago. Him and head coach Nelson Taroba, first year head coach for the St. John Riptide, have had some a falling out, it appears. Uh, he's been on and off the deactivated, the deactivated list. Uh, he's been parked on the bench for a lot of the last 10 games. Uh, so on that topic, I think it's a matter of... I do know, actually, that... Um, Stover's being shopped. Uh, Why? Why would couple, they do that? I don't know. I don't know. Like Elvin and I were talking about this early. You don't like a player with his defensive impact. You don't trade that. Oh, uh, it's a question mark, really? Especially because match. Sorry, matched up with an um, a Gabe Freeman. That's the perfect front line. Yeah, and the thing about it, man, is that. Like everything Jake just said was all defensively, man. Like that guy doesn't worry about scoring. He just He's wants just a to grinder, play defense eh? and rebound, dude. Like he is like a DeAndre Jordan. Like almost. You want that in the lineup? Like I said, I don't know what's going on there. Like we don't know what's happening, but I think uh, I would kind of go out on them and say if it's gotten to this point, they haven't just said, you know what? Let's be professionals. Come by my office. Let's go in here close the door. Get all That's our FUs out. Eat. Like let's just grit it out, man to man, in here. Figure this out and try to move forward. And then after that, if it don't work, then so be it. You've you've exhausted all possibilities, but. 
It's he's going to find a job too, isn't he? Oh, he's going to get a job with no problem, especially in this league. Oh man, they watch well, he's this got, sorry, He'll man. leave from. He'll leave straight from St. John and land where he's playing. He won't even touch yeah. down probably. At Jacob, home. what team should try to get him? Should like the Highlanders, the Titans, a lower team like the Riptide try to go after him, or what's your ideas here? Well, he's on the Riptide. Oh, oh sorry. lower than the Riptide? Or yeah, like, is there a team like, for instance, the Titans or the Highlanders? They're the, um, they're the lowest-ranked teams right now. Are they going, hey... <clears throat> I think the Titans need scoring, we need some help. so they don't need... Yeah. I think, like, obviously you can, they can always improve their defense. I think the Titans really need some scoring right now. Absolutely. I would yeah. even say, like, the London Lightning. For real? That, but that because would just put him over the edge, putting wouldn't up it? With, putting him with... Actually, no. He might not match up well with Royce White. Or bring him up if he came off the bench. Though, off the you bench, still yes. get you still get that presence down low because the London not they're not struggling for scoring. No, no. But if you take Royce off the floor and you bring a guy, you said the like edge that, though, Elvin. I, I would say even if they went with he went with the edge, they like yeah, they like he would it. fit like perfectly. They, yeah, I think he would fit perfectly for that style of play. Bottom line is he's going to get a job. Oh yeah, that's... Niagara's name has come up though. Niagara, oh. there's no like definitive. But what they've offered, their, but Niagara's put They've thrown their in cap in the ring, so to say. And I think him and Muldrow together, two of the best defenders, shot-blocking big men the league has seen, that would be... Yeah, that would be... That'd be it. Because <laughs> you're not Fierce. losing. Like we say, you're not losing, that, right? You start one, bring yeah. one off the bench, and that way you know you constantly got that presence there. My other question is this, fellas. It's a little bit off topic, but it's still a question from a fan, one of our super fans. He's also earned him a spot as a reporter with us. He's a go. He's an information guy. Carter Peckett rhymes with Jake Beckett. That's also the reason why I had to bring it in. Just worked. Um, he asked, and it's related to Isaiah Thomas and that little karate chop he threw down there. Oh, yeah. He got twenty five thousand for it. Was that enough, or should he got a suspension as well? I think that was fine. You know, he just yeah. kind of swung his arm like an idiot and just, you know, caused him a paycheck for a game pretty much. Yeah. Uh, I think that's enough. Like, there's no sense in suspending nobody like that. It, it, I'm pretty sure if they just did 25000 they don't think that it was, like, crazy deliberate or whatnot. But, yeah, 25000 though, I don't, I don't know. At this point, I don't care how much money you're making, man. You see 25000 missing off of something that – you could avoid. You'd be like, Johnny ah, nodding over there. Like that's punishment that enough. That's punishment enough, right? Like you can you can have a thousand in your pocket right now, but if you lose ten bucks and you go fill in your yeah. pocket and that ten bucks gone, you like ah, dude, like you gonna look for that yeah, ten bucks. Yeah. Like yeah, it's yeah. gonna you gonna be a little more careful with your pocket. So yeah, I just I think that's. Or if you guys are late and I say someone owes me ten bucks, Johnny. <laughs> Anyways, um, Carter also had another question. Is Rodney Hood going to get fined for smacking the phone out of that fan's hand? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's what happened. Yeah, not suspension, but. That's pretty funny. Yeah. He smacked the phone out of the hand? He wasn't aggressive or anything. The fan was just kind of like yeah. laughing at him. Rodney was like, get that thing out of my face. Yeah, and then he just like knocked it to the ground. Could you imagine if Royce White did that, though? Oh, my God. There <laughs> would be some that, fans. Not going to name that, names. Man. People be buying tickets to London so they can just be out there. There would office. be fans off with his head. that would <laughs> want his head <laughs> on a platter. I like, know. Uh, um, do we have any more fan questions, or is that going to be the wrap up for us? I think that's it. That's all. That's it. That's all we got going for us. Yeah. Well, we're going to wrap it up here then. A big thank you to Johnny on the boards over there sharing the crap out of this. Really appreciate it. Thank you to Morgan Howe. Now that's Morgan with one M, Howe with one H. So if you spell it with something yeah, different, there's going to be a problem. You got everything right, man. Got us sounding nice. <sighs> he did. Facebook he did a really good job. He helped nice. us hook it up with the Facebook yeah, we're idea. Facebook. Everything yeah, we're going to nice. get views. Kellen, yeah. you can scream all you want now. You want to say hi, Kellen? Come say hi. You can you say hi as loud as you want. You want come say come hi. Here. Come here. He don't want to. Oh, well, big shout out to Kellen. He did a very good job. <laughs> I'm very happy with him being quiet. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> I, I'll fix it in a minute. Okay. His transformer is on the fritz. We're going to fix it for you. Thank you, though. Um, fellas, if anyone's looking for a haircut, sorry, Juan doesn't do. He's only He only does one kind of hair, men only. No, no females. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he could, man. If they got a low cut, man. I'm sure. Yeah, if they want a low cut, up, he's just he doesn't know how to get rid of the split ends. That's just not his forte. I'm yeah. sorry. He doesn't shampoo or spritz it afterwards. Anyways, go see one at the Cherry Home Mall. You can reach him at five one nine seven one nine five seven two one. I said that really fast on purpose, just in case everyone was wondering. That's five one nine seven one nine. Oh, Charlie, you got it. You want to be a sponsor? Yeah, of course you do. Seven one nine five seven two one. Now I know it's nice out, guys. Some people are going to be barbecuing, but the snow is coming back. I swear to God. And you know who you got to call, right, Alvin? Yeah, man. You don't call Ghostbusters. They don't do that anymore. Yeah, I'm they call. make enough money. Yeah, I'm calling Seth. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there. Okay, maybe Kellen's got a line on him. I got to talk to him later about yeah. that. Um, but anyways, call my brother. Oh, Jasmine and Charlie are just having some fun. Um, call my brother Seth. Sethy, if you know him well. I'm sure you'll really like that. Call him at 519-532-0076. That's Perennial Landscaping. You can visit their website. Add my brother on Facebook. He shares his Facebook with his lovely wife, Anyanka. But anyways, any guys want to do a little shout-out quickly? No, I'm man, good, man. Man. I'm good. Big shout-out to the MBLC fans. Hopefully you guys like this. And, oh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Bell... I was a little under the weather, and big thank you to Ken Hu at Intercore Health for giving me the tickets to go sit in his season tickets, but I was under the weather. Um, Mike Bell, he took his son to the game last night. He got to take a picture with Doug Herring Jr. and... Um, Joel Friesen. Oh, that's Joel Friesen. Sorry. Joel Friesen, my bad. And you got Royce White, too. And Royce yeah, White. Boy. I got it mixed up there. Um, he, got a, he got a picture with jo- both those fellas, and um, yeah, he said they had a great time. I'm really glad you guys liked it. Other than that, everybody have themselves a wonderful day. Right. We're just going to cut the audio first. Got to do and our news yeah, anchor. we'll yeah. still be here for a second, then we're going to cut the feed. Got to do our news anchor after we cut the feed. <laughs>